next and last speaker of the session is uh, Hezu uh, Zhang Chan from Harvard University. Hello, everybody. Can, can, can you hear me? Uh, on the oh, nice. Yeah, these things are a little funny because they clamp on your uh, on your ears. Uh, no, I'm good. So I'm very excited to be here today to uh, discuss uh, our recent work, optimal cortical plasticity in a model of perceptual learning. Uh, so in case you're not familiar with the idea of perceptual learning, let me uh, just give you uh, uh, s some details. So perceptual learning refers to the improvement of performance in a perceptual task through experience, right? So perceptual tasks are, for example, telling apart two, uh, two auditory tomes or, or you know, bars of different orientation. Uh, we know it's very long lasting and common adulthood. And most interestingly, uh, by doing physiology, we know that uh, during perceptual learning, early sensory areas are modified. And that doesn't sound like such a smart idea, because if you think of early sensory areas, we usually think of them as these you know, supposedly unsupervised machines that do general purpose processing for you know, whatever tasks that we're going to do downstream. So it doesn't sound reasonable to modify them just to benefit one task, right? What if we're going to mess up all the other tasks that we, we've already learned? So that's ex exactly the question that we're posing here. How does perceptual learning occur in a sensory system that's needed for other tasks? Uh, and we're going to break it down into three, three parts. So the first part is that can perceptual learning be performed without modifications to sensory representations, right? That would be the ideal scenario where you don't make modifications at all, you just change some task-specific readout, and you don't interfere with other tasks. Um, if you have to make modifications, which areas should you modify? And finally, if you know which areas you're going to modify, what's the way to do it to avoid catastrophic uh, catastrophic forgetting. Okay, so before getting to these questions, let me introduce you to the model that we'll be using. So uh, we're looking at this uh, classic orientation discrimination task. Uh, so they're basically you're trying to tell apart these two orientations that are really close to each other. And then we imagine we have these uh, neurons with preferred orientations so that their uh, collective response are these uh, bell-shaped bumps, and we assume they have Gaussian noise. Uh, and then there's some yet to be specified fee forward network that does some complicated processing you know, for, for all the other tasks that your eyes or ears need to do. And then finally, there's a task specific readout uh, at the end. So in this case, the optimal performance that you can possibly get is that of maximum likelihood, right? because there's noise in the input. And we have derived that for any network to do maximum likelihood in this case, you know, your input-output relationship has to have this form, uh, which is quite simple, right? So R is a, R is a readout they're going to use to do uh, to decide which orientation it is. X is the input. V up is the uh, the best linear decision surface that you can draw in the input space, and the F is some uh, the scalar function that needs to meet some uh, mild condition. So one simple observation from just looking at this equation is that you actually don't need a complicated network to do anything, right? You can just have a linear readout, read from the input, and you'll be able to do perfectly. The challenge here is exactly that because we need this complicated processing for the other tasks that we'll be performing, we are kind of stuck with it, and we have to read through it, uh, and we want to see if we don't change this processing at all, can we, uh, can we get optimal performance? Uh, so the, uh, our, our model of uh, sensory processing, you know, basically have been introduced uh, by, by Jan and other people before. So uh, you, know, you have these neurons that have uh, convolutional weights. They use the same receptive field filter to look at different areas as the input. And then there's the pulling operation that you can think of as you know, simple complex cells or you know, competitive inhibition between cells. Uh, and then you know, the neurons we have are uh, rectified linear neurons. And then you know, you can this is kind of the basic module. And then you can stack this on top of each other and have a different module. Uh, and then towards the end of it, there's the uh, task-specific readout. So if we just train the readout and then you know, we initialize the filters with uh, some random filters, this is roughly what you see. So uh, you know, the dashed line is the optimal performance that you can possibly get, and the blue line is the uh, performance that you will get by just learning the readout. So it's suboptimal. And then the other thing to notice is that because the system is initialized isotopically, um, you know, the baseline performance is the same for, for the different stimuli. OK, so modifying om only the readout does not perform maximum likelihood. Uh, and in this case, like I explained before, you know, this deep nonlinear processing is actually a burden, right? Because it causes non-Gaussian correlated noise in the output, so it's really hard for a linear discriminator to figure it out towards the end. Now, what about more complex architectures? Can we find something that can do complicated processing for the other tasks while allow us to do this simple task without having to modify the processing stage? So uh, the idea is quite simple. You know, we have these cells that are using some filter to read from the input. 
why don't we add more cells that use some other filter, you know, which we're just going to generate randomly. And, uh, you know, they also read from the same input, and, you know, they pull their output uh, together. Uh, it turns out that if you just keep doing this, you know, adding uh, more types of filters, uh, you can just get maximum likelihood um, by just learning the readout. So, you know, the, the processing is still complicated, but you don't have to modify it to reconstruct a linear version of the input. It also works, uh, you know, if you uh, add yet one more stage to it, except that in this, t in this case, you know, you need uh, many, more, uh, many more filters for this to work. So on one hand, that's good news. On the other hand, it's also bad news, because that suggests to us that as depth increases, you're gonna just going to need dramatically more filters. In fact, we have some reason to believe that this kind of grows exponentially as a function of depth. So at some point, you're gonna, you know, the brain's not going to have that many filters for you to do this, and uh, when modifications are just unavoidable, which areas should you modify, right? So let's look at this, um, you know, simple one filter network uh, where, uh, where we basically have an early stage and a late stage, you know, and the, uh, and the readout. So it turns out that if you just modify the early stage, not the middle stage, and, you know, and the readout, of course, you will be able to uh, recover optimal performance. So modifying the early stage of your processing is sufficient. In fact, that's something you can show mathematically. On the other hand, if you freeze the first stage and then you only update the second stage, um, it's impossible to get optimal performance. So we, you know, we don't have a proof for this, but we say empirically it, seem, it seems necessary to modify the first stage. So we know that modifying the early area is uh, both necessary and sufficient. So now to the, uh, the last question that we're going to pose. So, okay, we know we're going to modify these areas, but what's the way to do it to minimize catastrophic forgetting? Um, so if you look at this case where, you know, now all the weights are going to be learned, right? They're all uh, color labeled in, uh, in orange. And this, let me remind you, is what we saw before, which is if you don't modify the processing at all, uh, you know, you have some baseline performance around, you know, 8% and up, it, which is suboptimal. So the, uh, the protocol here is this. You're going to train the network such that it performs optimally for one of those uh, stimulus. And you're going to test its performance for the other stimuli, hoping that you're not perturbing the baseline performance by too much. So for example, um, if you just do uh, ran, you know, stochastic gradient descent and backpropagation through this network, this is roughly what you see, right? So you get optimal performance for the orientation that you trained, but you get much worse performance for the uh, other places. Fortunately, what we found, and you know, we have an understanding of this that we can maybe dis discuss later, that the, the way to pre prevent catastrophic forgetting in this case is to force sparse modifications, right? Not sparse weights, as you know, people have been talking about uh, b before me, but sparse modifications. You try to modify as few weights uh, as possible. In that case, uh, you know, using the identical you know, training protocol, you know, now you have optimal performance for the train stimulus, and you preserve the baseline performance uh, for, the, uh, for the other orientation. We uh, similarly ask the question in a sequential learning context where uh, the idea is simple. You train, you train the network to perform optimally for one, uh, around one stimulus, and then do another one, and then you know, just do a whole bunch more. Right? Uh, and then after, you know, af after each additional training, you go back and test its performance for the uh, uh, to see how its performance is uh, for the original stimuli, right? So again, if you just use uh, regular training, uh, you see that you know because you are training more and more tasks after the first one, you interfere with its performance, and now it's no longer optimal, right? But if you use yeah, the sparse modification scheme that we mentioned before, you see that even though the network now does uh, n now has learned all these other tasks, it maintains uh, optimal performance for the uh, for the original stimulus. So in summary, that's the question that we pose. You know, how is this happening uh, in a multi-purpose uh, sensory system? And uh, we, ha we have three questions, and we, I think uh, we have answers to them. So the first one, can you perform perceptual learning without modifications? And the idea is yes, if you have a large enough number of receptive field types. Um, if you have to make modifications, which areas have to be modified? Uh, the answer there is uh, the early sensory areas. You know, if you modify them, it seems to be sufficient and necessary. And uh, finally, what's a way for the brain to avoid catastrophic forgetting when you learn such things uh, is you want to enc encourage uh, sparse modifications to the weights. All right, thank you very much. I would like to thank Haim, my advisor, uh, also my uh, friends and colleague, Ravid and Andrew. Thank you.
Okay, I have the first question then. Um, so can you give us a little bit of um, intuition in terms of what this sparseness looks like in terms of a scale of the filters, this sparse modifications that you were talking about? Right. How sparse they are? Is, is this a magic sparseness number? Or oh, I see, right. So, so, so if you go back to, oh, actually. So if you go back to the task that we're trying to solve, uh, right, it's a relatively simple task that can be solved by a linear discriminator. So what happens when you apply a sparse, sparse modification regularizer is that uh, basically one neuron in the, in, the, in the first layer just takes over the task, right? You ju really just need one neuron to do it. And then the, you form a pathway to send its output uh, to, to the readout neuron. So if you, if you have enough neurons that are coding for the other orientations, right? You, you know, just taking away one neuron doesn't affect your performance. Um, I've got a question. Um, what's exactly the stimulus that you're using? I mean, are you using a grading that? Um uh, right. So, so in this case, let me go back to my let me go back to my uh, previous slide. So, the stimulus stimulus uh, are actually these one uh, D stimuli that are you know these so so these uh, vectors that are just bumps. So uh, distinguish between like these shapes, Gaussian shapes. Yeah, it's in this case, it's discriminating between these Gaussian shapes. We're also working on uh, doing something similar for two D. Uh, for 2D stimuli and uh, also in more complicated uh, models. Yeah, I mean, uh, in general, like for discrimination tasks, right, you've got nuisance variables that say the phase of degrading or the exact position, in which case there is no linear readout that can, you know, um, recover the, the information about the orientation. Have you thought about that? Or what do you think is going to generalize about your results to the more realistic case? Like right, right. So, so you're right that in this case, it's very simple that you really just need one neuron to do it, right? I, I think what will happen uh, if we have these nuisance variables is that now, you know, the, the circuit that you're going to dedicate to the task will be slightly bigger, right? So now, instead of having one neuron, you know, you need many multiple neurons in multiple layers. But still, I think the idea is the same, that uh, you want to dedicate some neurons to the task so that, you know, if you have enough neurons coding for the other, for the other stimuli, uh, the performance for the other stimuli will be relatively uh, unperturbed. So uh, I'm two, two observations where I would like to have a comment. Um, the first one where you show that you um, just introduced more layers to have more randomness to pick from, may, um, maybe. That looks very similar to the idea of reservoir computing. Did, do you have, can you, can you comment why maybe those two are different? Uh, sorry, I'm not familiar with reservoir computing. Maybe you can, uh, you can t tell me about it after, uh, after afterwards. Um, and the other question, um, this sparsity um, um, tr training penalty you, you introduced, that one looks very similar um, to the idea of um, that is employed in continual learning. For I don't know if you know, for example, the paper on elastic weight consolidation. Yes. Um, can you comment on how those two relate? Yes, I'm, I'm kind of glad that you brought those up. Yeah, so there's recent work on that, but so the key difference is that in those work, you need some kind of metric to decide which ways you're going to modify it, right? So you, you, um, you train a previous task, so the idea is that you train a previous task, you decide how important each weight is for the previous task, and then when you learn a new task, you try not to modify the weights that are important for the previous task, right? And then they have different metrics, you know, fish information, uh, or kind of how much weights have, 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 have changed for the previous task. In our case, you know, we don't have, um, you know, we don't have preference like that at all. So, 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 so in a sense, it's much simpler to implement. Uh, and then the other thing is, right, w you know, we don't require you to keep some kind of memory over all the previous tasks that you've learned, right? In that case, you kind of have to remember, oh, this is an important synapse. That's not an important synapse. In our case, we, you know, they're kind of all equal. We just, we just want to make sparse modifications. Hi. Um, I was wondering, this is always an annoying question, but like, how would a neuron know to update its weights sparsely? Because kind of canonically, like in synaptic plasticity, a lot of the stuff is compartmentalized in a spine. Some of the signals propagate to adjacent spines and stuff like that, but they usually encourage synaptic plasticity to occur in those adjacent spines. I was wondering if you've given any thought to how sparse Im implementation of weight changes could possibly actually be implemented by some network. Um, so sure, an answer is no, I haven't. Uh, but maybe maybe you have some ideas that we can uh, talk after after the talk. So uh, so I thought it was a great talk, but you started off by talking about the fact that experimentals had found evidence that sensory uh, individual neurons change their firing properties in response to this this training, this perceptual learning. 
Um, yeah. Isn't it kind of a contradiction then to talk about the sparsity of perceptual learning since most of those methods are kind of sparse sampling of neurons? What is the probability of us finding a neuron that changes a perceptual learning if it's a sparse update of neurons? You know, isn't there kind of a it's kind of a funny, funny logic there. Right. That's a that's a great question. So I have um, I, I have two answers. So first of all, you know, um, really what you observe in those physiology experiments are what, what you really should call neurocorrelates, right? There are things that happen during learning. So it's not right, even though they happened, it's not clear that they're necessarily the changes that led to the improvement in performance. So that's one argument. The other argument is that there are constraints that I haven't presented here. So for example, uh, you know, early neurons might have small receptive fields, right? So so they can receive input from all the neurons, and now you need to update a, a cascade of neurons. So, 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 so see, it's in a similar vein, but you can easily see there are constraints where you, you, need, uh, you need to update much more neurons. For example, you know, more lateral interactions, in which case you can't just have one neuron do the task. You need to have a, a subpopulation doing it. So, so I, think, uh, I think those are my uh, answers. Thank you very much. One last Thank you.